Um, so again, I'm Maria Dover. I'm with the North Carolina Center of Excellence for Integrated Care, um, and we are a uh, health foundation that does a lot of grant-based work um, across the state to improve health outcomes. Um, and so a big focus of our work is um, to promote integrated care in um, both primary care settings and um, behavioral health settings. So some um, behavioral health agencies are bringing in a primary care uh, provider to do kind of of like a reverse um, integrated model where um, when patients show up for their behavioral health uh, needs, they also are seen by a primary care provider and get blood pressure if they have diabetes, hypertension, that sort of thing checked there. Um, the idea of it obviously is that it's um, for whatever whatever door they enter, they're coming to the right place and they get all of their services and needs taken care of in, in one door instead of um, referrals back and forth, which may not end up being followed up with um, and um, a lack of communication between specialties. Um, so uh, like um, she said in my training, I was a behavioral health clinician um, in an integrated setting, and so both in a hospital and then primary care where um, I would see patients um, before the physician would come in the room and assess any psychosocial issues going on that might have brought them in for their visit, um, kind of do a hallway consultation with the doc and say, hey, you know, Ms. Smith is, you know, struggling a little bit with um, a recent divorce, um, has some of these symptoms going on. Um, um, and then was available for follow-up with that patient um, after the physician assessed her. Um, so is that kind of the good intro? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> again, I'm representing two uh, organizations, agencies, uh, but I'm going to talk about some experiences I've had that go back even uh, further. Um, we were given a set of questions and said we didn't have to address all the questions, but the, the first three, if I can paraphrase them, what is integrated care, why is it so important, what's the benefits of it, and if it's such a great idea, why are we not there already? So uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm going to try to talk about those three questions. For the first one, what is integrated care, you all have in your seats this um, guide that as part of a group of um, North Carolina Psychiatric Association uh, members, we wrote for our members and others who are interested. And the, the short answer of what integrated care is, it's, it's combining the body and the mind back together. Getting treatment for your general medical care, same place you get behavioral health care and um, intellectual and developmental uh, difficulties. Uh, it's, it's not a one thing right now. It, it, I think most most useful uh, thing in this guide is the continuum of different kinds of settings in which uh, integrated care can be given, from minimally coordinated to fully coordinated. It's a it's a work in process. And then in the uh, handout, there's a uh, uh, a chart that I'm not going to try to go through this right now. It's something for you to look, but it it, it basically gives data showing that. Um, if you've got behavioral health problems combined with general medical problems, it's a exponential kind of cost. It's uh, they one one problem feeds the other, and it's uh, sort of a no <coughs> no brainer about whether or not you should be treating all of that in the in in the same setting. Um, so if if it's such a good idea, why is it so hard? Well, I I, I want to leave you with. Uh, a story and an image to, to think about. I, what I have here is I have some of the possessions of Dr. W. G. Ray, uh, uh, an in-law ancestor of mine, who, who practiced from the Civil War to around the 1910s. Uh, this is his pharmacy scale, uh, perfectly weighted still, uh, where he would take medicines out of his formulary, arsenic, bismuth, magnesium. Uh, <clears throat> this was this was one of these drug rep things that, that came around. Keith can read the uh, in, ingredients in that. These, these were some of his tools. And, and then I have uh, 
I have a, a note that was written to him May 25th, 1910 from Bozeman and Townsend, dealers in general merchandise in Rockfish, North Carolina. Um, they, they wrote to Dr. Ray, Dear Doctor, please give John Wood's wife what medical aid she may need and I will pay you when I come over. It, this may be the, the, the earliest documentation of employer-based uh, medical insurance that, uh, that, that, we, that we have. Um, uh, I found it to be a, a fascinating thing, along with his phrenology book, and I, I once owned his pistol and his ledger books where he had the Negro patients divided from the white patients and <coughs> took payments of eggs and bushels of, <coughs> of different things. Um, I've, I've donated them to uh, the Hope County Museum, where, along with his desk, which, uh, so you, if you ever go to Hope County, you can go to the Hope County Museum, and, and you can see a little display of what his practice uh, would, would have been like around, around 1910. So what, what, why am I talking about this? Well, his world changed. His world changed from his horse and his gun and his ledger books and his uh, pharmacy scale and all like that to, you know, just kind of an approximation of what we have now. You know, you have a, a doctor's office where you go in and you make an appointment. Um, you show up or you don't show up. Um, the doctor sees you. Maybe it's a family nurse practitioner. Maybe, it's, maybe you. But but anyway, it's a, it's a place you go to get your. He wouldn't recognize um, our world here today. And my my point in this is we're on the cusp of a change that you're not going to recognize. Probably the, the younger people in here aren't aren't going to recognize the next version of healthcare. The, these were Dr. Ray's tools. Uh, our tools now are data systems, smartphones, computers, televisions. Um, all, all of those things are going to are going to greatly change the the way that um, uh, that we're going to provide care for people. Now here here the point I'm building up to is here's the problem. It's a disruptive change. It's a and it's an enduring and disruptive change. And my vision, my view of what the problem with getting to this, getting to integrated care, is is managing change. Everybody in the system, the reason we're not there already is that everybody in the system whether or not you're an elected official or a provider or a patient is having difficulties accepting this. And uh, <coughs> back to one, one more old book. This is uh, a textbook from uh, er, my, some of my early days. This is actually dated 1952. And it, I, I sort of stole it from a library. You know, back, back when the libraries had these interesting things, they had these little cards with you write your name on. And then you give it to them, and then you bring your book back. They put it back in an interesting uh, system that they, that they had once upon a time. But anyway, this, this is about managing change. And what um, one of the points in here is that people resist change for three reasons. One, they don't understand it. Two, it's forced upon them. And three, it's a threat to their well-being. Status, money, power, role. The change that's coming along now has got all three of those. It's coercive, people don't understand it, and it's gonna so greatly change the power structure within the medical community that it's, it's gonna be hard to get there. It's gonna be hard to get to, uh, to integrated care. And I, I'm gonna sort of stop there, but if people are interested in hearing more about you know, wh where I think the difficulties of the different systems, you know, how, how the elected officials are having trouble with change, how the providers are having trouble with change, how the patients are having change, how the organizations are having trouble with change. I can, I can go some into that now, but I'll stop right there and um, move, on, move on to the next person. Very good. Thank you. <coughs> All I can say is I hope I don't have to pay the fine on that book, <laughs> being the uh, non-psychiatric professional person here. Um, I am a cancer researcher at, at uh, UNC. I have been for many years, and I, but I also have a son who, who uses um, the system 
um, quite a bit. I, I compare that, uh, this summer particularly, uh, he had a, a psychiatric e or a psychotic episode. He wound up in the, um, the unit here locally for about a month. And I compare, um, I mean, these things are obviously very much a family diagnosis. It's not a patient diagnosis, it's a family diagnosis. And it's devastating to families, and you don't know where to turn. I look back a few years <coughs> when my wife, uh, about three weeks before we were married, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. About four days after that, we were at UNC in the Resource Center wonderful place. They provided us with information on resources we didn't even know we needed at the time. It was great. A and if they didn't know something, they could find that information for us. So as a cancer researcher, basic cancer researcher for years, for four years I learned a lot about the clinical side of cancer. So I naturally, and, and forgive me for this, but <laughs> I naturally walked into this setting last summer expecting that there would be similar resources, similar information about where we could get help, what we needed to do to help my son. Brick wall, brick wall, nothing. I, I really, I still am not, I've learned more tonight sitting here than I have since he got out of the hospital and while he was in the hospital. Um, and, and that's probably why I'm here, because I thought, wow, this would be a good, good opportunity to get some information. So, so I'm not an expert on integrated care. I probably am an expert on receiving that care and maybe on some places you might need to go. I, I, I really, I, I like the idea of integrated care. And I'd have to say, while it may be difficult, it probably isn't as difficult as getting the diagnosis and not being able to find the resources that you need to d deal with the problem. So I will leave it there. Thank you. So again, I'm Keith McCoy, and um, the part of the system that I know the best is um, the, the public behavioral health side. Um, I work with Cardinal Innovations, which is the um, managed care organization that grew out of the old county mental health centers. Um, we can, I could do a long history lesson uh, as well as um, Dr. <laughs> Bridges about uh, where we've come from um, and ways that we're going back to some of that old model in the public system where you really do have um, one-stop shops to go for um, that are even more integrated than the old county mental health centers used to be. But the state um, grew these um, government agencies into being managers of both the Medicaid funds and the indigent funds, those for the uninsured poor. Um, they also manage, those, those are usually state and federal funds, but they're also frequently county funds that we manage from our more well-to-do counties that have money to give, and, and Orange is certainly one of those. Uh, but we manage the mental health, substance abuse, and intellectually and developmentally disabled funds, uh, Medicaid and, and uninsured poor funds um, for 15 counties in North Carolina. We're getting ready. Um, in the po process of um, negotiating with the state in Mecklenburg County of taking over Mecklenburg as well. So that will make us the second largest insurer in the state behind Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, but we still are quasi-governmental. Uh, we operate kind of like a private entity, but we have elected officials on our board. Um, and who we are is established in state statute. Um, so we would run similar to sort of like a public sector hospital system like a UNC or a um, Carolinas um, health system does down in Mecklenburg. That's kind of that hybrid public-private-ish model that we operate under. Um, we operate a um, no-profit system. So the state pays us separate administrative dollars from our service dollars. Anything we save in service dollars, we have to reinvest in new services the next year. So there's no 
um, profit motive for saving money. Um, really, the targets are in part set by the state um, for making sure that, that we save money each year. Um, and um, we operate um, under what's called a Medicaid waiver, where certain rules within Medicaid uh, are waived. And the one that's mainly waived is this sort of open network. You can go to any provider you want that's willing. And instead, we work with a closed network of providers, which allows us to control the market a bit to ensure financial viability and hopefully uh, for our provider system. Um, and hopefully to ensure higher levels of quality and that we can choose to work with providers that we believe provide higher quality services. Um, easier to do that in a county like um, Orange where there are lots of high quality providers than in some of our most rural counties including some that um, Dr. Bridges used to be over like Warren County which has about 20,000 people in it and lots of space. So uh, managing in urban or suburban areas is very different than in very rural areas. Um, so what we do is sort of like an insurance company. We authorize deny care, but because we have um, that sort of public sector background, the piece that we know uh, really well when it comes to integration is that social services piece, integrating with DSS, Child Protective Services, DJJ, um, jail systems, police officers, um, school systems, those are the areas that we're used to making sure that care gets integrated. And before you guys came in, we're talking about the, the outcomes that matter to us. As much as I would love someone to have a, symptomat a decrease in symptoms, I'm really far more interested in their ability to maintain stable housing, to maintain employment, to stay out of the crisis um, healthcare system and to stay out of the crisis legal system. For an adult, those are the four things that I care about way more than whether or not they hear a voice from time to time or whether or not their mood is euthymic. Um, and that requires very tight coordination amongst a number of different um, service lines, um, such as housing, um, supported employment, um, shelter plus care, HUD housing, um, uh, working with parole officers, all those types of things. For children, it's uh, their ability to um, move through the education system and finish their education, and also to live in a safe environment, um, which can be easier said than done when it comes to difficult households, difficult parenting situations, situations of abuse. Um, it's very hard for us to achieve our goals if those systems aren't all working. Um, the, the piece that I think is important that Dr. Uh, Bridges um, showed was the, that graph that demonstrates how much higher medical costs are uh, when there is a mental health or a substance abuse diagnosis. And so that's that last piece of integrated care that we have a harder time with because we're only responsible for the funding of the behavioral health system. We are not in any way responsible for the funding of the physical health system. And in, usually in order to save money on the physical health side, you have to spend more on the behavioral health side. But in North Carolina, that's not how the system is designed right now. Um, our incentive is not to save money on the physical health side, and we're all in agreement that that really needs to happen. Those incentives need to shift a little bit so that more can be invested in the behavioral health system and then less money will have to go into the physical health system um, because we'll be able to prevent, um, I guess better prevent unnecessary episodes of, of care such as hospitalization and emergency room visits. Um, so um, I can talk a lot more about our network, about the sorts of resources that we have for adults and children, for those with developmental disabilities all across. If, if people have specific questions, please let me know because I could talk for hours and hours about it because it's that complicated and nuanced. Um, but, um, but anyway, that's, that's a little bit of an orientation to what I do and what my areas of expertise are. both of your scenarios. One, serve as a, a, ca a catalyst in the community to help bring about better integrated care and also kind of get people to the right places mm -hmm. uh, and be almost a, in a navigator role or something like that for them to help push them into the right uh, spot if they were to come to the health department or be referred to the health department. 
Um, you know, I think when, when it comes, your all's focus is, is fairly narrow. Obviously, when it comes to county commissioners, it's, you know, invest in housing and, and other sorts of things for your population, and that will really help us out a lot. Um, the, the main thing I think you can do is to learn about the system as it is and to make sure that the departments that you represent um, or oversee um, are appropriately connecting with the services that exist. So making sure that um, there are collaboratives that go on where everybody's at the table. And often there are. I'm sure there's a number of collaboratives that exist. But, but sort of making sure that those um, uh, conversations and those collaborations are happening between housing, law enforcement, behavioral health, uh, physical health, um, when it comes to um, kind of making sure people know how to navigate the system. Um, I don't know if y'all have other thoughts. Well, Maria, and, and since she actually done this, tell us how this provides primary care. Yeah, I was going to say, say some health departments provide primary care, some don't, so then it's different. But the, the health departments that we work with that provide primary care services, our main focus with them is on uh, prevention and screening. Um, then along with what you said, even actually before actually screening, is knowing the resources available. So when you do find positive screens, you know where to connect those people to. But um, we certainly, the prevention piece is, is the biggest piece of, of what we feel like um, the medical community can do so that um, things don't get too far down the line and it's like, well, we'll why didn't anyone jump in? Why wasn't there anything done? And so um, we are working with providers across the state to, to screen children through adult um, substance abuse, mental health, social emotional issues. Um, and there's a variety of resources. You know, there's a spectrum with different communities. Um, but knowing who to refer to. And then again, that local MCO, if there's not a resource, then they should know about that. That look, we have patients that are exhibiting these kinds of issues and we don't know where to send them. Can you help us? Um, but that's been yeah. successful in, in the, um, the areas we've worked in. Yeah, we're not really funded on the prevention side. That's not, um, some of those comes, come occasionally through grants. We get, we get some grant monies, but usually those um, are assigned to very specific entities within the community. Um, and we were talking about before you guys came in how important detecting things in the school system um, can be doing, you know, having teachers learn mental health first aid, mm -hmm. um, those, those types of things that will help them um, detect problems before they happen. Often you get to the MCO once we've got a diagnosis and there needs to be treatment. Um, things are far less concrete before that time, but yet your interventions can be far more effective mm -hmm. earlier on. And so I think prevention is, is a key role, uh, especially within the school system. Um, I've only been at Access Care for less than a year, but I was in another CCNC system for a couple of years, and I know more about the health departments in, in that area, which I won't name because I'm going to say some critical things about it. Um, the, the, and health departments are different from county to county. Some have more resources, some, some have less, but there, there are some of the health departments who, who really don't endorse the whole patient model. Um, you know, if you talk to enough people, you're going to hear, well, we do this, but we don't do that. We do that, but we don't do that. And that's what needs to change. So, you know, to the extent that you, you know, can scrutinize your local resources, do they have a, an approach that uh, looks, at, looks at the whole patient? For instance, when they screen, then what do they do? Do they have really robust referral sources? Or is that somebody else's job? How much responsibility did they take to, uh, to make that referral and make that happen and then follow up on it? Or is that, that's somebody else's job? That's, that's what we're talking about, integrated care. But is that what we're talking about? I mean, in my mind, I see integrated care as both services are available in the same place. Is that just wrong? 
I think it's a, like um, Dr. Bridge said, there's a spectrum. So uh -huh. I think you can have integrated care where there isn't necessarily someone on site. But then if you go to like the full integration model, yeah, there is behavioral health or reverse on site and it's a team approach. Well, and I, it's I think that's what I just said, you know, that, you know, it, the health department that you're involved with and responsible for, uh, you know, if, if they don't have the resources to, to do it right there, then do they have resources to make sure the referral happens? And that's one of the models for integrated care. You, you're, you're never going to have, well, it's going to be a long, long time before you have everything under one roof, and it's going to be a long journey to, to getting there. But you can still do some of the lesser versions of the integrated care, the collaboration, uh, uh, communication, that kind of thing. What, what, what I think is wrong with too many systems is that they, they punt the task of making sure that care is coordinated. I have a question following up the idea that where you have physical uh, issues and mental issues together, that the cost for treatment or, or dealing with it um, are exponentially higher. I think that's the phrase that was used. So why is that? Is it because it's just that much more complicated? Or is it because the money is unwisely spent? If you have someone with diabetes and high blood pressure, uh, they need to take their medicines. They need to maintain a healthy lifestyle. They need to do a, a number of things that, uh, that cares for those illnesses. If they're depressed, they're less able and motivated, or w they're, w they're less willing and able to take their medications. They're less willing and able to uh, do those uh, self-care type things. And so the uh, the diabetes and the high blood pressure goes out of control. And diabetes and high blood pressure then has uh, you know, more consequences and the person gets more depressed. It, the, the two of them feed on themselves. I, I think that's exactly right. Um, <coughs> there's sort of less capacity often from our more severely ill population to comply with treatment recommendations. The other piece that complicates things is, is many of our medications within um, psychiatry will make some of your illnesses worse. Um, we have a number of medications for more severely mentally ill patients that are going to give you diabetes, they're going to make you obese, they're you know, going to make whatever you were heading down that trail for happen more quickly. So it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, proper treatment can make it worse but it's necessary, um, but lack of proper treatment also makes it worse, so it's, it's, a, it's a little tricky. You're talking this about it's going to take a very long time to get to a truly integrated system. What do you see the roadblocks on the one hand, and what do you see, what's the incentive structure to make that kind okay. of cultural change, Let to have that happen? I, I have opinions well, <laughs> about, of course I'm you. about <laughs> why that's true in all these different areas. But let me talk about the two that I know most about. First, I, I know about psychiatrists. Psychiatrists, by and large, come from a culture of independence and privacy. And they don't like to communicate about their patients. They don't like to share information. They're uncomfortable uh, with, uh, with sharing information. Uh, they don't like collaborating with uh, family doctors, and not a, not all of them. There are there are your early adopters, and there are your true believers, and there are people who do this extremely well. But by and large, the culture of psychiatry isn't buying into this. They like their private offices. They have power, status, money, and uh, moving away from. Uh, from, the, from that kind of structure is a threat to them. And one, one way that it's a threat is that you can't get to integrated care with a fee-for-service system. Right. That's going to go away. They're going to be paid, the psychiatrist is going to be paid as part of a other organization, either on salary or as partner, but it's going to be a much more complicated than, okay, here's the bill, send it to the insurance company. If they pay for it, I'll keep seeing you. If they won't, you Go, go away. Um, and <coughs> so, so psychiatrists are, are part of the roadblock. 
and uh, this committee that I work for, the Access to Care, actually it's changed its name to Health Care Services Committee, is, is working on that. It's a, it's, it's, a, it, it's a form of resistance to change because it, it's a threat to them and it, it, uh, it's not something that they're endorsing. Uh, I'll also talk about the organization that I work for now, Access Care. You know, Access Care, part of CCNC, has a wonderful potential, a, a marvelous potential to be a major, a big player in, in providing the coordination of services that your son needs, that everybody needs, but they ain't there. Um, they started out as an all medical system and Access Care is mostly nurses mostly nurses without a mental health background. And they've taken the tiniest little baby steps into changing that, but they're holding on to what they got just as hard as they can to see how this plays out. They're not hiring social workers with mental health training, they're not hiring nurses with mental health training, and they're, they're, they're kind of stuck in, in what we got is pretty good, we like it, and we're not gonna change unless somebody really makes us. Uh, the, the potential for CCNC and Access Care is there, but it ain't happening yet. Everybody likes their silo. And silos are very destructive within the healthcare system, but it's true within all specialties. I mean, everybody wants their, their little piece the way that it's been. I do think generationally, you're gonna see <coughs> with some of the younger psychiatrists, one, more of a desire to be employed rather than to own your own business. It's just kind of prefer to have a check come to us that somebody else takes care of. So I, th I think that that will change uh, over time. Um, and the nature of psychiatry is changing. Um, that, that kind of drives some of that feel. We're less therapists than we used to be um, and, and more, um, a little more medically oriented. The science is getting a little bit more developed than it, than it used to be. Um, and, but, but ultimately, everybody's got their piece. And, and even trying, you know, as, as you see the state, try to nudge the system towards a more integrated model of managing all of Medicaid, massive pushback. And it's because we all think there's this subset of people that only we know how to deal with. <laughs> Nobody else is going to know how to deal with them. Um, I think we're working really hard within the North Carolina Psychiatric Association to encourage the idea of psychiatric leadership. We want physicians to be in leadership over a team. They don't need to be involved in all the details of patient care. Um, and physician leadership, I think, in general, can help move forward an integrated team. Um, but, and, and even I get pushed back from the North Carolina Psychiatric Association when I try to pay psychiatrists more who are part of integrated agencies then they're just like, well, what about, my, I don't want to discourage my docs that have their private practice. And I'm just like, your doc that has a private practice that's seeing my Medicaid patients, they're not talking to the rest of the system, so I don't want to pay them more. I want to pay these docs more. There's an entity <laughs> called, there's an entity called an Accountable Care Organization, as part of the Affordable Care <coughs> Act, that is supposedly the, the future. And in it, everything is under one roof, uh, psychiatrists, clinical social workers, other mental health professionals are, are all a part of one team. They're, they're part of one team. Um, we're, we're a long way from, from, from getting there, but in the psychiatry schools and the residency programs, nobody's being taught how to do that. Right. They're still being taught how to work in state hospitals and right. uh, private practices and all like that. Yeah, community-based care is not the focus. Um, so that, that needs to change. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't go away without having a little bit of a swipe at the elected officials here. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know what people's politics are, but if you're one of these folks that are fighting tooth and nail the Affordable Care Act, then you're fighting integrated care. Because that's a mechanism that is gonna push these integrated systems putting everything under one roof. And unless the politicians can figure out how to come together and fix what's wrong with it, rather than just fight it and try to kill it, that's setting us back more and more years. Yeah, I'm on the, uh, I'm a new internist. I'm on the council for the North Carolina uh, American College of Physicians. And 
at the recent council meeting, several physicians who are from rural parts of the states were lamenting the lack of Medicaid expansion. And I can guarantee you that those guys are registered Republicans. <laughs> this, is not, this is not a political <laughs> issue for them. They're lamenting what's going to happen to their hospitals. Yep. But also the women in their 40s who are showing up with advanced breast cancer. Um, and I know they're, they're, they're not Democrats, um, but they also care about the suffering of people in the communities and also the suffering of their institutions. And they think that this is insanity. I'm not expanding Medicaid. Yeah. It's hugely important to the system to expand Medicaid. Uh, I think. So th what happens is, is that luckily, well not luckily, but the statistics are is that people of all politics eventually get gravely ill. And when it's, you'll end up having to have a policy moment where when people see, uh, who don't agree with this, where there's someone in their family will get too ill for anyone to take care of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll look we'll at the message. No, I, I, was just, I was reminiscing a bit. Years ago, I was um, the director of EMS in Virginia, and that exact thing is what it took for laws to get changed, you know, to, to better the emergency medical services system when you had legislators or daughters get killed at intersections and God forbid, but that's that is the motivator. Well you yeah, one of the greatest testaments to integrated acute care is the trauma activation system in this country. Mm -hmm. um, you can take gravely injured human beings I did four years of VR work in rural North Carolina. And it doesn't matter how much money they do or don't have and you will save their lives. They won't you won't have someone die of a ruptured spleen anymore. Um, sitting in a rural ER waiting for a helicopter. Um, and uh, but with the, the uh, mental health system, is, you can't help those people right now. You come in, you compensate it. Yeah, we have people wait in emergency rooms for some of our some of our worst ones. I think we've gotten up to almost thirty days before somebody waiting in an emergency room for a hospital bed. Are there other questions from the board of health members? Uh, I'd like to. Yeah, so it's in a perfect, you know, it's a perfect system, a great system of where at one point along the way you think perhaps that somebody would have recognized something and they able to prevent what happened to you. But what, I mean, looking back at hindsight, is there a point where you think would, you know, if we had this system in place, then maybe it had been caught there. I mean, somebody mentioned a teacher at school about, I mean, and that's, I guess, another question. I wonder. Even somebody who would work at the health department is going to do the screening. What, is that what type of training you would have to have to be able to recognize uh, the other situation? You know, I, I, since I was asking to do this, I've been asking myself that question. And once I understood what integrative systems were, what you were talking about, and the, um, I, I look back and. Uh, my wife, I met my wife, uh, my sons were already uh, three, let's see, seven and ten when I met them, so I wasn't around early in the years. Um, my, my son, who was sick, was diagnosed very early. He was a tough kid, you know, apparently diagnosed with uh, pervasive developmental disorder, which as near as I can tell back then was a a term you guys used and you weren't sure what <laughs> Right, we have a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, one thing I've learned is this week it's that. Next week it's that. Uh, so I don't know that I could say that there was a point uh, that, that it would have been um, a trigger or, or something that would have been detected. My son was never, I mean, that to me wasn't, I mean, he was he's ADHD very badly, but Passing over the line to the psychosis occurred when he was in the sixth grade, after my wife and I were married. And so I don't know if the schools could have seen this coming. We didn't see it coming, uh, neither my wife or I, at that time, nor did I really see it coming this time. It's all of a sudden, this time is, was we were in the emergency room for four days. And 
was diagnosed, uh, he was sent because he was considered homicidal suicidal. So that was scary. I don't know that there's a point that I could say the schools or his physician would have picked it up. Having said that, in my in my reading here, my my question was, no offense to primary care physicians at all, but can they? I mean, are they friends? Uh, to pick this sort of thing, I'm sure, I'm sure. you're well, assuming you're talking about the, training, but yeah. The, 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 see, this this is the problem that the Affordable Care Act and the Accountable Care Organization is designed to resolve. In, in other words, you know, if we could go back and, and your son was being treated by an, an accountable care organization that's up and running, hitting on all the cylinders, he would have a medical home. This is where you would go first thing, you would go to the family doctor to try to figure this out. And that family doctor would have in-house someone like you, uh, a psychiatrist consultation, uh, and, and, and the ability to, the, the ability and the willingness to assertively reach out to the school system and gather all this data and, and, and intervene. That, that's the way it's supposed to work. That would be far better than the way it's working now. The uh, medical mm -hmm. medical home is an important concept. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with that terminology, you should you should educate yourself about that. And there are a lot of different ways to get there. <coughs> like, the the thing that underlies all of this is how do we pay for it? You know, how do, how do we reimburse the system appropriately so that you can afford to have a psychiatrist and a therapist in a primary care office? Because there's not enough volume at every primary care office to do that but how do I get them there conveniently? And then you start saying, all right, well, I gotta think outside the box. So that's where telemedicine comes in. That's where I'm just like, all right, I can invest in a TV and I can contract with another organization that um, has telepsych capacity and then I can, they've got a large enough network such that when I need them, I can get them there. They've got you know, somebody who's always there. Can we pay for a grant um, or help fund something like that? Can we? redisperse some of our physical health uh, personnel within the health department in Orange County to some of the agencies that are dealing with the chronically and persistently mentally ill that can't afford to have a PA or an NP or a primary care physician come on site um, to, to see their patients even though that's probably the only place you're going to get to see them. Um, and so a lot of times models have to come through kind of grant funded uh, systems then you have to show that you've saved money and then you can get a true payer source to say all right I'll start paying for that regularly through Medicaid Medicare um, or private insurance and the potential savings that though are, are actually there with uh, some version of the ACO actually CCNC has proven that money can be saved in the general medical arena what they did was that they targeted illnesses like childhood asthma uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, metabolic diseases, and made sure that those diagnoses, those individuals, were getting treated in the family doctor's office, not the emergency room. They drastically reduced that kind of costly. Tr trouble is, that's not the savings in the same system. Uh, it's 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 not all integrated into one system. So the the, the emergency room has no incentive to save money. They they their ERs generate revenues for the hospitals. Their incentive is to put a billboard up that says it's only six minute wait. Mm -hmm. Come with your cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you see. Um, some emergency rooms are resisting um, buying into a program called the Project Lazarus, which is a uh, planned uh, to manage narcotic medications. Uh, you know, you, the, some patients travel from state to state to county to county, hopping from emergency room to emergency room to get multiple refills of uh, narcotic medications. And uh, some are starting to catch on. Some physicians and some emergency rooms now have policies. Uh, to address that. Others had no interest in doing that. Um, and that's another one of those resistance to change. We have our, our silo in the ER, 
and don't tell us what to do. So I think we have time for one more question. Does anybody have? I would just like to know who's doing this well in our state. So we're doing an integrated, there's lots of little demonstrations. There are a couple. Trying to show we can do it. There are a couple of functioning ACOs in North Carolina. One is in the Greensboro area. Mm -hmm. If you want to uh, call up a guy named Art Kelly, uh, you can get in touch with him through the North Carolina Psychiatric Association. And uh, Art, Art is the person I know that knows them. He's a psychiatrist. He knows the most about psychiatrists functioning in, in, the, in the ACO environment. I think ultimately, there, there's nobody doing great, though. This is, and it's simply because of this funding structure issue that the, the incentives aren't aligned yet. And so no one is motivated to create something new because they don't, they can't get it paid for unless they're siloed. Mm -hmm. There's just no way to afford it. I work for a large health system and we've often talked about, we have to keep getting paid the way we're getting paid because until that tipping point happens, mm -hmm. absolutely. we still have to get your revenue to avoid. Yep. And there's pediatric practices that we work with that are doing this well and some adult practices, but again, they're grant funded. Yep. So the model is there and they're, and the providers love it and they work as a team and the patients feel cared for. Um, so the, the, they're doing <laughs> it, but um, when funding runs out is, um, is the issue. One quick, um, can we talk about the VA system? That's a medical home, it's got mental health integrated different pain system obviously. Anything on that? Um, all I know is when I read that it, it's it, it's a well functioning model for these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It it has the pieces in place but it's incredibly understaffed and underfunded. Mm -hmm. So it it its incentives are more aligned but it is burdened by inefficiencies that are typical of very large public agencies um, and you know as you saw from what happened in Virginia uh, yesterday um, with you know that person was sent home from a VA because there weren't beds and he ended up killing himself and stabbing his dad um, and so you know that's rare our, our patients are far more commonly victims uh, of violence than there are perpetrators of violence but you know, what's been in the paper is there wasn't a bed available within the VA system. And we always find that. I do consults at Rex Hospital, and whenever we have a VA patient, I would say 0% of the time I can get them over there. So they're always full. So, and, and that's the other piece that I wanted to put out there is whatever you build or decide to look at, immediate access should be your key. That's what's important. You have to be able to do what an ED can do. So when you find their blood pressure is elevated for the second time, I gotta be able to get that addressed now in my system within my you know, mental health clinic. I have to figure that out. And, and so telemedicine, telepsych, those types of resources are, are very, very important um, uh, as the only way to really get that paid for efficiently at this point, because they can do it fee for service without having somebody on site with you immediately. That's kind of our, our only means of, of doing that. And one, just one more on that. Um, I was at a CCNC meeting yesterday, actually, and so they were talking about out in Greater Mecklenburg, in the Charlotte area. Um, they're trying to find an in-between between the ED and a, a medical home as far as what's driving people to the ED. So some of it is, there's various reasons, but it's warm and they get a meal and they feel like they get attention and they may call their doctor's office and not get an appointment right away with the access to care kind of things. Um, so they've, they're developing a model where there's like an in-between choice um, that there's these group settings at this clinic that they feed them, there's a physician there, um, they meet their needs. So it's drive, not driving them to the ED. Um, it's not as great as their medical home, but it's something in between to give them, give patients uh, an option um, that some of the reasons that drive them to the ED would be met um, at this lower level of care. Um, so. And that's that full integration model that includes housing and everything else that mm -hmm. you really have to look at. Just doing medical and behavioral health is not gonna get it. You have to have that full spectrum in